Ruth 1. I just want to skip down. This is where Ruth is choosing to be with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And so in verse 1, 16, we're going to read here to you guys. Uh, this is as Naomi is asking them to basically leave. It says, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will, there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. I want to point that out because I feel like this shows loyalty in servant leadership. Loyalty to your pastor, potentially loyalty to the your team that you're on, where God has placed you in the season, but it's also a loyalty where Ruth is saying here, I am loyal to your God. And just and so again, thinking about being flexible and hosting. Remember, we're hosting and creating a space of hospitality for God first. <coughs> your God will be my God, says Ruth. And then for the people that God's placed over us in leadership, like Naomi is over Ruth here. And I think that's beautiful because Naomi or Ruth, excuse me, is just like, okay, I'll do it. Let's do it. Where are you going? I'm gonna go. I feel like God has placed me in your family, regardless of what happened to my husband, I'm gonna go. And so that spirit of I'm gonna do what you say as my leader with the submission to what God is asking me to do, that that is step one. And when you do that in a sort of leadership role, people start to notice. So in, if we look over at verse, chapter 2, she's just going to go out to the field. Um, so this is an, another amazing point about Ruth that I just love. If you look at verse 2, 1 through 2, I'll read that real quick. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, so this is Ruth noticing something. Ruth says to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. Naomi didn't ask that. Ruth saw the potential. Ruth saw the need, identified it, and acted. A huge part of creating the space of hospitality is owning it. Whatever your role is, whether you're on a volunteer team, whether you're serving on staff, whether you are just trying to serve your pastor in some fashion, looking for the need before it's verbalized. <laughs> it's a skill. It's something you can grow in. Um, but it's a, it's a way of, of being aware of their needs before they need it and just having it there for them. It does need to take up space in their mind. On a weekend application, you're like, I'm not gonna even, me, I'm not on the facilities team, we have a great facilities team, but I see that trash can, go empty it. You don't have to call our facilities team, they're busy keeping this place running. As a servant leader and creating space for hospitality, if you see a need, identify it and own it. When you have a heart for hospitality, it's more than, here's a new mug, I'm so glad you visited, which is great, but it's more than that and it's a, measure of, of just owning every part of the building, owning every part of the ministry that you can serve and that you can create an environment, again, for God and for the people that he's bringing here. Just like Ruth, did. she saw that and she said, oh, I'm going to actually go do this. Let's see what happens when I go to the field that Naomi didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, that Naomi didn't even ask her to do. And so once she does this, in the scriptures we see that Boaz and some people notice her and... <clears throat> Apologize. So when she's out there, Boaz notices her. And I feel like that just speaks to the reality that when you're serving, when you're looking for what God wants you to do in an arena, when you're looking for what you can make better, when you're looking for how you can welcome people into the space that you're in, people talk about it <laughs> in a good way. The leaders are going to start noticing. Maybe you're a volunteer and they might find a team lead position for you because you are you're showing signs of ownership of this place because God put it on your heart before even a leader put it on your heart. 
Because again, we're here to host God, we're here to show that loyalty and faithfulness to God above all else, and that starts to show, and people see it. And it can be an opportunity for growth. As you go down in Ruth's story, we see that in verse, I won't read it, but in, in chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, Naomi is basically talking to Ruth about, hey, I see this opportunity with Boaz, and she gives her a list of, like, I want you to prepare, I want you to go here, I want you to make contact with him. And I feel like this is a good example of something I know I've felt in ministry with our ministry team, that there's tension sometimes. Maybe I'm happy and cozy in my meeting space, and I don't want to go do this new thing that you're asking me to do, Krista or Pastor Rick or whoever it might be. But as Ruth shows here, she listens to her leadership, and it's still under the submission of God, and she does it. There's, there's a tension there, but she walks in what is being asked of her in that servant leadership. She doesn't talk back. She just prepares, and she goes. And when she does that is when you start to see throughout the rest of the book of Ruth that literally it leads to Boaz going to leaders in the city to talk about how he can be the redeemer and the transaction that happens there. But leaders talk about it. They see your heart, and God will help you flourish in those positions when you are humbling yourself in that way. And at the end of all of this, in regards to Ruth, she marries, oh, excuse me, marries Boaz, great, awesome. But at the very end, she is the mother of Obed, who is the grandfather of David, in the lineage of Christ. You don't know the seeds that your quiet faithfulness in servant leadership will grow to become. You don't know. You don't know how listening to your leaders will develop this fruit in the lineage of Christ. She had no idea that's what was happening. She was being faithful. She was listening. She was identifying needs. And now she's in scripture as a great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. Like, you don't know what's at the end of your faith. So keep that in mind. When it comes to hospitality, every intentional snack that you put out, <laughs> every handwritten note of thanks, and every name that you remember after a weekend is a seed that God sees and that the people who you're interacting with are seeing. So I want to encourage you guys, whatever your role is, that those are seeds that can be intentionally planted and aren't, they aren't wasteful. Being intentional about the coffee that you buy for your pastor is thoughtful. Being intentional about the thank you notes for the volunteers who came in to serve for a full day for free is, is going to change hearts. And you might not know that at the time, but it is impactful. So to swing a little bit into a few practical tips while we have a little bit of time here, I want to make sure we're doing all right. So a couple things along with flexibility that I want to point out that I feel like these scriptures speak to in Ruth, as well as just things to be aware of when you're looking at how to create a space for hospitality, both for the Lord and for the people that he's placed in your ministry, is communication. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard of base camp? <laughs> anyone who knows me will laugh. Um, anyway, uh, so Basecamp for me is like my love language. It's, it's a project management system. We use it a lot here for event planning. I can show you a little bit of that if we have time. But regardless of how you communicate, when you are planning an event, when you are creating a space for a guest speaker to come in, and when you're preparing for your weekend ministry, communicate and say it clearly and say it 300 times. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I know that every person on our team is not um, is not wired that way. They're not supposed to be wired that way, but I am, and so it's my strength. And so I've been placed here for God to help, for me to help create a room for hospitality and for servant leadership here. And so part of that is helping communicate. So I mean, even this conference is a great example of that. We're working on the changes that are happening. Great. Dr. Michael Brown and Pastor Lee, the ministry that's happening in the session, awesome. Okay, well, what are we gonna do? Let's get with our team, communicate about when this workshop is starting, when the next ones are starting, and then tell everyone a hundred times what was decided. So wherever you are in ministry, remember that one of the best ways to love someone is to speak clearly and truthfully to them. I listened to a Craig Rochelle, he has a leadership podcast, and he did one with Dave Ramsey. And Dave Ramsey said, I don't have the quote, it just came to mind, 
But Dave Ramsey literally said something along the lines of like, like clear communication is loving communication. Because if you're beating around the bush, and if you're trying to like kind of cover something up, or you're not just telling it straight, like you're taking up someone's time, and you are potentially going to have to re-communicate this, and that, that trickles down. If I have to communicate a change to Pastor Sean and our production team, I don't want to be like, well, I don't know, what should we do? We could, we could move the workshop, we could cancel, what should we do? I'm going to say, what works for you? He tells me what works, and I say, yeah, okay, we're going to work, this is the decision. We are going to continue our workshops, they're going to end at the same time, and we'll keep the rest of the afternoon flowing. And then, clear cut, communicate that down line. So even in regards to communicating to guests that you have coming in, and even in mind of communicating to our congregation what we have happening at church, because we're all busy. The churches are busy doing amazing things. But we want to be clearly communicating to our people. And one thing we do here at Radiant, when we plan out our entire calendar year, try, um, we lock in our calendar, <laughs> which is never really locked in. And you all know that. But we try to log in our calendar of like what events we have coming up. And then we publish that thing. We're like, here, staff, here is everything we're doing January to December, in theory. Um, if anything changes or isn't on here, it's a conversation that has to happen. We can't just say, hey, let's go do this. Because we have this planned out. We have our seasons of what we know we're focusing on in January. We have our C21 days, which is awesome. And it takes a lot of work from a lot of our teams. So we don't want to do a whole lot else in that window. In May, we have this thing called the Rise Shine. It keeps us busy. Uh, the summer is a slow time, we say, but not really. Uh, this August, we get to have a prophetic presbytery. I think we're having uh, Pastor Wayne Drain back along with some other team members, and that's a lot to coordinate. So our summer is really a lot um, focused on that. The fall kicks off, and we go seek 10 days along with a couple other events like True North. And so we have this calendar year, and even for me to serve our ministry teams, and to serve our church, we're going to make it clear what's coming up. If there's changes, we are communicating that a million times to everyone involved. And we are just trying to be available to what God might change. And that's not that we're putting rigid lines on that, that flexibility part. But for what we know, we're going to communicate it and make it clear. And then flexibility, we touched on a lot. And I literally wrote down this conference, Jackie Krista. So lots of things have been flexible for this event. Another one touching on the ownership and humility part. Um, out of, I wrote down Philippians, I believe it's Philippians, uh, 2 3, where it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Mm -hmm. On the conversation of owning every part, I am not above. Helping facilities. I'm not above serving in kids by any means. I am shoulder to shoulder with every person on staff or serving this ministry because that's what God has asked me to do. And keeping that in mind, again, whether it's weekend service, event, getting ready for a guest to come into your space, you have to be willing to do it all. And that's okay. Because if, if your heart and your role is such that you are, are part of the servant leadership, you're an admin, you're a coordinator, maybe you're an assistant pastor, volunteer, whatever the role is, you have to own it and know that you're not above anything. <laughs> and that's great, because again, that goes back to what we saw in Ruth, where Ruth had been through some stuff. She, Her husband died, and she had left her hometown to be with her new family, and now she's like, okay, what do I do? Well, she decided to stay with her, and this example I'm drawing is her leader, her, her oversight, her authority, and do what was needed. And she decided to go to a field and to glean some wheat. Okay, like maybe her job at home was like cooking up some awesome lunches, but she's like, all right, I'll do it. Let's go do this. I see this need, I'm gonna do it. You have to be willing to take the step to again, identify that need like we were talking about earlier and own it. But when we do that, you don't go around talking about it either because that's not very humble. <laughs> No, this doesn't count, because I'm up here <laughs> sharing with you guys. It might go down in history being recorded and everything, and maybe my pastor will see it. But 
all that aside, um, the reality of owning it, but then being humble about it, because it doesn't matter who took out that trash. What matters is that the trash was taken out so that the next guest who walked by had space to stick their coffee cup in, and that we didn't spill coffee on the floor that could potentially make someone slip. Like the, the whole domino of what your small seeds of intentionality are doing, again, you don't even know where they're leading. You don't know that that frustrated single mom who finally dragged her toddler to church that weekend just wanted her coffee, but that she it got cold because her toddler was being crazy. She didn't get to drink it. She goes to throw it away, and it falls out of the trash can. And like, how ticked off would you be? I have a toddler, and that would just be like, all right, I'm done. This day is done. But just keeping that trash empty would avoid that, hopefully, for that mom. So remembering that and remembering from the scripture that you're not doing this for yourself, you're not doing it with selfish ambition, but you are counting everyone above you, and that's a way to open the door for yourself to serve, have servant leadership present in your life. Another thing that I'll touch on, and then I'll leave a couple minutes for questions, is um, spirit-led. So at Radiant, we have... Um, created what we call the Radiant Way. It's kind of a living, breathing thing that is still kind of developing. The staff is starting to talk about it. Pastor Ben and Pastor Rick and our lead team um, really put this together. But what we say is we are, as, as Radiant, we are spirit-led, simple, and scalable. And that can be applied to nearly, it should be applied to every area of ministry. Being a person who is looking to create a space for hospitality or to allow for servant leadership, um, you got to do things in as simple of a way as possible. And you have to understand for growth, it has to be scalable. So one of the things we're recognizing is even in down to our ministry processes, we need them to be something that work. Call it like our like if we have a new visitor coming in. They fill out a card. What happens next? We want to have a plan for where that information goes, what system it goes into, who touches it, so that if God provides an open door for a Radiant Church Otsego in our area, we can basically say, hey, Otsego team, here you go. This is how we do it. This is the Radiant way, and you can take this, and you can create a space for God in the Otsego community to show up. And so keeping it spirit-led, which I could go on about, but I feel like even hopefully our experience this week so far has shown what some of that looks like. But allowing God to do what he needs to do and praying about the small decisions and the big decisions and listening. Even with this workshop, I wasn't supposed to be the main one leading it, but then when Krista wasn't able to be here, a fun thing to touch on, uh, I hadn't read through all of her notes. We had a like doc of what we were going to talk about. We were working on it. She had added some. And when I was preparing, when I knew she wasn't coming, I was like, okay, God, like who's the person that I want to talk about that's a good example of servant leadership? And he put Ruth on my heart. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go back through Krista's notes and make sure I have my stuff all organized. <coughs> and she had added some scriptures from Ruth that I had never saw. So I was like, okay, God's got something in mind. So hopefully this will touch someone. But so even that, I was like, okay, that like gave me, you know, I'm headed in the right direction. I feel like this will land for someone because I'm going to pray about this. This is more than me up here with a microphone. I'm up here to take some of your guys' time, which I don't take lightly, and I want it to be something that God wants to say. So we're praying about it. We want it to be spirit-led as part of the Radiant Way. And so even being spirit-led on your weekends is because you want people to feel cared for. And that obviously carries over to our guests when we have guests that come in, like for this conference or even just a weekend guest speaker, we are trying to take care of them to the best of our ability. And that doesn't have to equal a big budget. I don't want anyone to hear that because I know that resources are different all across the board. But it is just the thoughtfulness and it's the time and it's the sincerity that will create a space for your guest speakers. When they come, and one thing that I know Krista likes to mention, so I'll, I'll throw it out there for her, is she literally like stalks their Instagram before they come. And, she, and so she, they come into this house and she's like, oh yes, 
she, uh, it makes me so sad that Jackie wasn't able to come on a couple occasions, but, or a couple reasons, but man, the gift basket <coughs> that Krista put together for Jackie was like a personal shopper did it for her. She picked out some of our merch from here that we were going to give to Jackie that is like totally on her brand and like her colors that we've seen her wear on Instagram and like just being that intentional about how you're welcoming in your guests will show. Because when they come in and they see their favorite coffee in there, they see my favorite color t-shirt, even though they've never seen your merch before, whatever it might be, the thought that goes into that is a seed that is going to be planted even for their time with you. Because they're going to come in and feel cared for and like ready to go into whatever it is that they're here for. They're, they're not going to come in and be like, oh, I need a water. Oh, I wish I had some coffee. I'm hungry. I just got off the plane. I just want a granola bar. Like, you have that ready for them, and you're you're already creating this hospitable space for them that they can just walk into and do what God has for them to do. Um, so I'm racing through it, but I am on my last page here, and I just want to reiterate that if you're if we're talking about hospitality and servant leadership, whether it's your first impressions team, um, whether it's again ministry, you're hosting your staff, you're hosting your pastor, whatever that looks like. You want the practices, processes, and all the elements of your hospitality to be scalable because God isn't doing this just for you. He's not doing this just for your congregation, probably nine times out of ten. The people you are touching with all of these intentional steps, maybe they're going to go plan a church. Maybe they are learning how to disciple their family and they're receiving a little bit of that from how you are hosting them so that they can go home and they have the energy to even do it. So I just want to remind you guys of that. And that kind of wraps up my notes. I want to open it up for some Q&A. If you guys have questions, I have a couple things I could show you, but I don't want to necessarily take up time with that and see if you guys have direct questions that I can speak to. And I'll go over these if not. And I know we have some people online so let me know if you hear any questions over there. But do you guys have questions? Okay. Well, yes. If you like walk the line of enough and too much. For guests or yes, thank you. Um, so the question is, how do we walk the line between enough and not too much? Or, or too much. Or, sometimes people feel overwhelmed. Right? Sure. <laughs> So how do we walk the line between enough and too much? We don't want to overwhelm, and we don't want to skimp, we'll say. Um, it is a fine line. I think a lot of it can be, if you, again, look at it from a personal relational hosting, and like connecting with your guest who's coming, less, if, if that's where you can put your resources, do that, because that will be easier to gauge, and you're not going to overwhelm them when you're, verbally being available, you're saying here's your space, you're figuring out the schedule before they come so they know when they have downtime, they know if they need to get away what that looks like and you're not forcing a host to stay with them all the time, like you're asking them their preferences so that you have a gauge on that ahead of time. And one of the ways, you can, I'll ask you if I actually answer your question here, but um, one of the ways we do that here is we literally have a guest speaker form um, that we build out and we send to any guest that's going to join us. And this asks, uh, we do a lot of Instagram stalking, but this answers a lot of the questions. <laughs> um, so literally, Krista or myself or whoever's working on getting our guest here, we'll send this to their admin or to the guest directly, and it's going to ask about their travel plans. It's going to ask if they want a rental car or if they're going to drive, if they need someone to pick them up. We're letting them tell us what they want, and that informs a lot of what we then do to try to make them comfortable, because that kind of puts some boundaries on it for us. If they're like, I want to hang out with my host the whole time, well, then we're going to pick a host that's great and chatty and is up for like taking them to dinner. But if they're like, yeah, just pick me up when it's time for service, then we're going to make sure their hotel's booked ahead of time, that we have their guest basket there, and we're going to give them the space so that they can get there, settle. And usually you get a lot of that from this. And um, I know Danielle has this for online, but if you guys want to let me know if this is something you'd be interested in looking at, it's it, sense of um, <laughs> this really helps us to understand what they want out of us does that help mm -hmm. so 
Any other questions? Do you even see you can hit on the things I had ready to go? <laughs> yes. Do you have a card or something that we can take back with us so that way when we get home we can call you guys and maybe have you send us something? Uh, I, I do, not with me, because that's how prepared I am. No, um, <laughs> literally my email, and I would love for all of you guys to email me, is cferson, so my name is on the um, workshop list, cferson at radiant.church. Okay. So please email me. Sorry, I don't have my card on me. He was asking if there's a way to get in touch so I could even send you guys some resources. Um, if you have questions after this, please email me. I'd love to expound on anything that I shared, or if you have other questions, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what does reconciliation look like when there's not been clear communication or there's been miscommunication? What does that look like? Like, do you think on like an event level you're asking or just across the board? Across the board. So, the question is, what does reconciliation look like when there's been miscommunication? And that definitely happens. Um, and honestly, it's a tension. I, I feel like this goes back to what I referenced with how I was picturing Ruth in the moment of she's doing her job and then Naomi's like, can you go do this? And you're like, oh, but I have all these other plans. I like feel that tension a lot and we have it happen here. So I would say um, at Radiant, we try to even follow the example in Matthew of the communication reconciliation of if there's an individual staff member that I feel like dropped it or comes to me and says, you dropped it, I'm going to have that direct conversation with this person. So if it's an individual, I would say we go to them and say, hey, I feel like we're not hearing each other. Um, I feel like everything I have done to prepare, you didn't see this. Like, you made this change, and I want to be flexible to honor what you're saying needs to happen, but you're saying it's a small change to update the website or whatever it is. And it's, it might truly just be because they don't know. They don't know the work that goes on over here because they don't have to because that's my job. So what I would do if it's an individual is I would literally try to go to them and share that and say, hey, I feel like this miscommunication happened where either you made a change and didn't tell us or we didn't tell you the change. But either way, I need you to know that's all of this. It affects all of this. We're going to be flexible and make it happen. But it felt like you weren't honoring the work I put in. So, because I feel like I've had that conversation before. <laughs> so from that standpoint, that would be me sharing that I feel like the miscommunication was maybe from a team member back to us. So I would address it directly. And then if for, if for some reason that doesn't land, then I would go upline. I would go to my supervisor. And again, on the element of trying to, to be humble and to own your own mistakes, the same thing with ownership and humility, you can take that into this conversation to say like, hey, if it was me messing up and I miscommunicated, say this is where I miscommunicated, I'm sorry. Just like, again, truth, straight, clear communication, like sorry, I, I did this and it was wrong. Clarify what should have been communicated and apologize and be upfront about that. I think being quick to apologize goes a very long way on a congregational level too. Because we've definitely sent out emails with like wrong event dates or something. <laughs> and then you just send out another one saying, hey, we're so sorry. We really hope you can sign up for baptisms on this weekend, not this weekend, or whatever it is. And don't don't pretend that it didn't happen. Because it, mistakes happen. You just have to own it. So, so in summary, own it, be humble, and kind of follow that Matthew reconciliation of I'm going to talk to you directly. And then if it needs to be addressed, I'm going to bring in our supervisor. Maybe we have like a full conversation just to share what's going on. Because again, you want to leave communication open between team members because you don't want that to affect events, weekends, ministry, etc. If that helps. Go right back here. Uh, Cassie, can you review um, your onboarding process for from the time someone approaches you and says, hey, I feel like I want to volunteer and on the team to the time you're releasing you go? Yeah, so we have um, a class called Be Radiant Class. We have it about every other month. Um, and we try to keep that consistently going because that is where we point people to. If they're attending and they want to get to know Radiant more or they want to learn how to be on Team Radiant, which is our volunteer team, we tell them to sign up for that. When they attend, they get to hear a lot about the church history and they get the opportunity to learn about different ministry opportunities or serving opportunities um, and fill out an application. From the Be Radiant class on, um, that application goes to the correct ministries those pastors of those ministries or directors of those ministries review the information, we 
get in touch with individuals, and then we kind of connect them to see if, if the areas they want to serve is a good place for them to serve. And usually, the it doesn't require it doesn't require anything outside of we do want them to go through the B rating class because that allows them to know understand the vision and the structure that we have here, so that when they go to serve, they are fully plugged in and like on board with what we're doing. <laughs> Does that answer? That was like a really quick. So, so no background checks. Yes. Sorry, we do do background checks. I'm okay. doing high level. We have a couple different versions that we can do, but we would definitely once they have the application, they have a conversation with the pastor. A background check is done before they're officially on Team Radio. Okay. And there's like a deeper layer of background check we do for kids ministry. You do that for every how long area? Sorry. So you do the background check for every area of ministry? We do, and then there's a deeper one that checks like multiple states and multiple addresses, and it goes a little further that we do for kids ministry. Daniel, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Training material. You know, when you get somebody that wants to do hospitality, if they're doing, say, first impressions. Yeah. Uh, what type of training material do you have for them to see before you put them in that role? Like physical materials? It would honestly be, I don't believe we have physical materials. No, so we don't either, we download them yeah. on the internet. Yeah. I think from Grace Church in sure. the Twin City. And then we also try to mentor them, to, you know, or they come with us the first couple yeah. times. Well, I thought maybe you might have had something better. Yeah, no, that sounds great. So the question was, um, I'm like taking notes. No, uh, the, question, <laughs> the question was if we have physical like materials that we put in the hands of people who are on our first impressions or our hospitality teams. And um, we don't have physical outside of, again, going through that Team Radiant, or B Radiant class to be on Team Radiant helps them understand our entire operation. And so that kind of downloads a little bit of the heart. And then there's a training process where they're like shadowing one of our normal first impressions team members, and there's a relational training that happens. To my knowledge, we don't have like a packet that we give them. But we are getting close to wrapping up. Is there, I don't know if I saw another hand. We'll go ahead, we'll take your question, and then we'll wrap up and I'll hang up with you guys um, afterwards if you have more questions. So um, I was just wondering about, um, like, our whole church is smaller than your staff. Sure. So my cameras were very small. So yeah. it kind of happens. But I was wondering, a large environment like that we were involved in, <laughs> is it conscientious who serves the servants? In other words, um, you know, is there a hospitality for your team and the rest of the teams around here? Sort of. Uh, the question is if there's a hospi hospitality team to support the hospitality team. So that, um, right. if there's people supporting staff, even. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, and for an event like this, we have everyone scheduled out, and we do have people in charge of getting our event team food. Like, we, it's stuff that we help think through ahead of time, and literally all of our staff is doing different roles than we maybe would have otherwise to help facilitate them. And I think that goes into weekends even sometimes, depending on what we have going on. Our hospitality team is always very available to, like, our campus pastors, our campus managers. Um, and, but I would say I appreciate that Radiant, by and large, we're all looking for those opportunities, and it kind of happens naturally because we communicate it as a value. So it's kind of everybody, um, but it's still an intentional communication and value that we put out in front of people, and the people who are really on board kind of emanate that. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I could, I, yeah. we, we try to do that too. We try twice a year at least to have a meal yeah. for everybody on our team. Bring them all together, so because some people don't even know each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that happens small or large. We have two. We have.